Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I am Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Today, someone writes in, Dear Pastor, I am an Orthodox Lutheran who has watched most of your videos and enjoyed them greatly. Thank you. I'm wondering, what do you think of the charismatic movement with all its trappings of speaking in tongues, miracles, signs, and wonders, and contemporary worship style? God bless. Now, for our viewers that aren't familiar with this movement, the charismatic movement began officially in 1960 after Pentecostalism had infected several mainline Protestant church bodies, including a couple Lutheran denominations. When someone calls themselves a charismatic Christian, generally what they mean is a person who believes that the Holy Spirit continues to give what they call the sign gifts uh, to Christians in every age of the church, and so those gifts should be sought by Christians. Now, by sign gifts, generally uh, there are three big ones. That's speaking in tongues, the um, healing, and general miracles. We have to note, though, that when the Charismatics generally talk about speaking in tongues, they're not talking about what we see throughout the book of Acts and in 1 Corinthians, uh, where it's speaking in other languages, uh, but rather what they mean by tongues are uh, unintelligible heavenly languages. So, uh, charismatic believe that these signs continue to be given to the church. Now, if you go online, you'll often hear terminology in this debate, uh, such as continualist versus cessationist view. Uh, charismatics call themselves continualist because they believe that the Holy Ghost continues to give these gifts uh, through ardent prayer and devotion, while uh, cessationists believe then that the Holy Spirit has ceased to give these sign gifts to the church uh, and that he quit doing it after the apostolic era then. Uh, ultimately, charismatics believe that uh, these gifts, or charismata, as they're called in Greek, are the key to spiritual renewal for themselves, but also for their churches and their church bodies. Now, the next question people often ask then is, well, where do charismatics get these ideas from? Well, we see this a couple places in the scriptures. Uh, we mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 12 just a moment ago. Paul speaks there as to the regulation of spiritual gifts that have already been given. Uh, St. Luke records the speaking in tongues that follows baptism uh, several times throughout the book of Acts. And then Jesus promises his apostles some of these gifts in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. The, the difference here is charismatics look at these passages prescriptively, meaning they read these passages and say, God is here thereby prescribing how we should receive these gifts, uh, and then he, therefore he's promising to give them in every age, whereas historically the church has always uh, looked at these passages and read them descriptively. These passages are simply describing uh, what God the Holy Ghost gave to his fledgling church at that time. Then, So we don't see any command that Christians should seek these gifts, nor, and most importantly, do we see a promise that God will give these gifts to all Christians in every age. Now, he does, as we mentioned, promise these specifically to the apostles so that they can fulfill their God-given task of uh, preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. So, we said in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So Jesus makes those promises, and then we see those promises being fulfilled throughout the book of Acts. They're healing infirmities. They're driving out demons. Uh, they are speaking in new tongues on Pentecost. Not only that, but in Acts 28, verse 3, we see St. Paul taking up a serpent, inadvertently, getting bit by it, and not dying from the venom. We see the same progression in the book of Acts. Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus tells them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here Jesus again promises his 11 apostles that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and enable them to speak uh, the gospel to all nations. And Christ fulfills that in the next chapter in Acts 2 verse 4. St. Luke writes, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They then preached to the men gathered in Jerusalem who had come from all the ends of the earth. Then, you know, in, in all these places, uh, we look at these as simply the Holy Spirit is describing the gifts he gave that fledgling church for the benefit of the church, uh, for the establishment of it in the first century. Now, the bottom line with these passages from the New Testament about the charismata is that they aren't prescribing 
these gifts for future generations, that we should seek these gifts. Uh, the New Testament is simply describing what happened in that first generation of the church. The gifts of the Spirit were given to demonstrate the Spirit's presence to the fledgling church and to confirm the apostles' teaching as true and divine. Now, once the church was settled, so to speak, uh, those gifts were no longer necessary. And I think this is the first problem with the charismatic movement. It teaches people to look for things that God has not promised. Now, the flip side of this, then, is that it teaches people to think little of the things that God has actually promised to us in his word. This becomes the most apparent, then, when we start to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, according to charismatics, how God gives these spiritual gifts. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, according to the charismatics, is a personal experience of God's immediate presence. Now, then things like speaking in tongues, doing miracles and healings and the like, these are all outward signs that someone has internally been baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh, or filled with the Holy Spirit, it's another way they put it. Now, but we run into the, into the same problem that we did before. Christ promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the apostles, and he fulfilled that promise on Pentecost. Even when the Holy Spirit falls on the Samaritans, say in Acts chapter 8, or Cornelius in his household in Acts chapter 11, or the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19, that phenomenon is given to demonstrate God's approval of the Gentiles being incorporated into the church by faith in Christ. Now, a baptism of the Holy Spirit is not promised to anyone but the, uh, the apostles for Pentecost. Uh, so that when these gifts are given to others, like in the rest of the book of Acts, it's simply God's imprimatur on the apostolic teaching to the Gentiles and nothing else. Again, if something isn't promised to all, then all shouldn't be seeking it from God. You know, there's another serious problem, I think, with this charismatic idea of baptism with the Holy Spirit, and that is that it teaches Christians, then, to despise their actual baptism as a means of grace. So first, clearly, St. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 5 that there is one baptism. So he, not two separate baptisms or one baptism given at two different times. There's simply one baptism. Second, when we, when we seek a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit, that implies that the Holy Spirit was not present and active in the baptism of water and the word actually commanded by Jesus or that his presence there was inferior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is better and fuller. Now, St. Paul writes in Titus 3, verse 5, that God saves us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So baptism is simple water combined with God's word, and in that baptism, God regenerates sinners by forgiving their sins and by giving them the new birth as sons of God. Uh, it's also the way the Holy Spirit then renews us continually daily throughout our lives. Paul in Romans chapter 6 talks about this, how baptism is the means by which the Spirit works in us to mortify our sinful flesh and bring forth the new man of righteousness each day. But if you're busy seeking a baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's apart from the baptism that Christ has commanded and the baptism where the Spirit is active, then you will eventually grow to despise your baptism and ultimately think little of it. The central issue when it comes uh, to the charismatic movement really isn't continualism or cessationism, as it's often put. Because could God still give these gifts today? Well, sure. But he hasn't promised to give them. What he does promise is to work through the means of grace that he's given to us. The preaching of the gospel, baptism with water combined with God's word, and the Lord's Supper. Those are the places that he's promised to be to forgive our sins, to give us the Holy Spirit, and, and, to, and to renew us for the fight against temptation on a daily basis. The scriptures never direct us to seek a personal experience of God's immediate presence in any other way other than me, his God's presence mediated through his word and his sacraments. The charismatic movement separates the spirit and his work from the word and sacraments, and this is ultimately that movement's downfall. Now, one final note. Tongues, uh, healings, and miracles should never be taken as automatic proof that someone has the Holy Spirit or has special gifts from the Holy Spirit. In the first years of the church, the apostles were present to verify these things as being actually from God. You and I don't have that anymore. What we do have instead is Christ's word in Matthew 24, 24. 
false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. This makes John's words in 1 John 4, 11 incredibly appropriate. Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't trust folks when they claim to have special measures of the Holy Spirit or his special gifts because God has not promised them to us. And Satan most certainly imitates the apostolic gifts to deceive many and to lead them away from God's sure and certain word that he gives us in the gospel, in his scriptures, and in his baptism and Holy Supper. Thanks for the question. We'll see you next time on Ask the Pastor.